The Jerry Pal Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation. Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well-being of older Californians and their caregivers. And supported by listeners like you, many of whom have donated on the Jerry Pal fundraising site, which you can find at www.jerrypal.org, big blue button, or through reviews, stars on your favorite podcasting app. Big thank you. Welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have with us today? Oh, I'm so happy to welcome to our podcast Janet Abram, who is a dear friend, teacher um, of mine from back in the days of residency and fellowship. Taught me everything I know about symptom management for patients with cancer. Um, Janet Abram is professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and the Department of Psychosocial Oncology and Palliative Care. She is the author of a fourth edition now of Comprehensive Guide to Supportive and Palliative Care for Patients with Cancer, along with co-authors Molly Collins and B.R. Dobman. Janet, welcome to the Jerry Bell Podcast. You. So this podcast, to be we're here. going to be focusing on the management of cancer pain. We'll talk about some pharmacological, non-pharmacological ways to think about it. But before we get into the topic, Janet, do you have a song request for Alex? I absolutely do. Alex, would you please play Truckin' by the Grateful Dead for me? <laughs> and why this song? Well, I was a deadhead in college, you know. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. It went on forever. That's a good reason. Yeah. You know, we have done, we have recorded, I think, probably around 250 podcasts. And shockingly, I am shocked, but I believe you are the first person to, to request oh, the Grateful Dead. I that, also love the Grateful Dead. My first concert was Grateful Dead in Ann Arbor back wow. in like, I don't know, uh, the late 80s. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, Gary was still alive. Yeah, Gary was which still is alive. Right, Alex, I right? Marin is a kind of a. Isn't Phil Lush? Doesn't he have Terrapin Crossing? The yes, yeah. A lot of the bar. Grateful Dead members, yeah, live around here, and they lived around here probably when they wrote this song. You know, on the break from their travels around the country. Absolutely, classic Grateful Dead team. All right, here's just a little bit. Trucking. Got my chips cashed in, keep trucking like a doodle man. Together, more or less in line, just keep trucking on. Arrows of neon and flashing marquees on a main street. Chicago, New York, Detroit, and it's all on the same street. Your typical city involved in your typical daydream. Hang it up and see what tomorrow brings In Dallas, I got a soft machine In Houston, too close to New Orleans New York, I got the ways and means But just won't let you be Beautiful, <laughs> thank you all right, Janet, I got to ask the question. Uh, fourth edition of this book, um, yeah. hundreds of pages in it. Uh, I always like to ask, like, what motivated you to, to even start writing this book, let alone the fourth edition, but the first edition? Well, the first edition came about because um, I had a lot of good stories about my patients and what I'd learned from them. And my husband, who's a poet, had a really interested editor who said, you really need to put these stories down because you have a lot to, to share with people. So back in 1999, really, the first edition came about. And then each edition is a testament to how much I've learned because I knew no psych stuff, being an oncologist back in 1999, who would have taught me what affect meant? Nobody. Mm -hmm. So then I went to Dana-Farber to learn from Susan Block and her colleagues. And then every edition since, it um, reflects what my patients and uh, my colleagues have taught me. And so this time, it really needed an overhaul because of the LGBTQ issues, because of interpreter issues, because of the fact that the words minority and non-minority don't make sense anymore. You know, there was just so much. And also I had really encouraged people to take opioids back in the, in the early two thousands, because that's what we were doing then. 
Um, nobody was taking them. We didn't have pain as a fifth vital sign then. Mm-hmm. So all of that really had to be revamped in terms of opioid safety. Mm-hmm. So I was really excited to bring in a couple of co-editors who were young and hip and, you know, like at the cutting edge of palliative care now, along with my collaborators, the social workers, the psychiatrist, mm-hmm. uh, a chaplain to really make this book relevant for now. Mm-hmm. That's the main thing. I would say the the drugs didn't change as much as uh, all the stuff about sexuality and about family dynamics and spirituality, all the things that I'm hoping people will will get from this book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a wonderful book. Um, ab- you know, that the, the word in the title is absolutely correct. Comprehensive guide, right? It has chapters on so many aspects of, of palliative care and supportive care for people with cancer. And today we're going to focus on management of pain and other distressing symptoms. Probably, we'll see if we get to other distressing symptoms. <laughs> to start with pain, there may be some talk about hypnosis. I don't know if one of us is going to be hypnotized on this podcast. We'll see what happens, listeners, um, today. Uh, I wanted to ask you about s- some uh, medications that uh, are, uh, you know, sort of hot medications that only palliative care experts seem to know a lot about. Well, maybe palliative care experts and a few other select specialties. Um, Maybe we'll start with ketamine. What is the role of ketamine in treatment of symptoms for patients with cancer? Well, this is really controversial because there have been so many conflicting studies about whether ketamine works or whether ketamine doesn't work. I'll have to share with you my clinical experience and uh, my reading of the literature. Mm-hmm. What we use ketamine for is the patient who has become often hyperalgesic on standard opioids like Dilaudid. We're asked wait, to see. Wait, can we oh, stop sorry. there one sec? I love getting reflection re- re- refreshers for our audience who oh, may okay. not remember, because I always have to look it up. What's the difference between hyperalgesia and allodynia? So, Allodynia kind of is before hyperalgesia. So allodynia means that you've changed the sensation. Mm -hmm. So your A fibers, instead of reflecting touch anymore, start to reflect pain, start to conduct pain. Mm. So whenever you're touched, you have pain. Mm. So allodynia is like pain in response to a sensation that is ordinarily not painful, like light touch. Exactly right, like touch. Mm -hmm. And then hyperalgesia. If you look at the spinal cord, you can see that that. That's what's happening, that there's Mm -hmm. activation. Hyperalgesia is a central nervous system toxicity, neurotoxicity, Mm -hmm. such that there is spread along the spinal cord so that a touch one place hurts another place. There's myoclonus involved. There's often maybe even delirium involved. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, It's like when you have a very bad sunburn and you go to touch that area of the skin, you know, just a light touch Mm. will turn very painful. Hmm. And when we see this is in with well-meaning uh, clinicians who are increasing, usually it's a dilaudid drip in a cancer patient mm-hmm. with really bad neuropathic pain, mm-hmm. meaning the pain is from the nerve that was injured. Yeah. So when a nerve's injured, it keeps firing. Mm-hmm. And when it does that, spinal cord changes, and there's lots of little chemicals there that stop the opioid from working. So you have mm-hmm. to go up and up and up on the dose. And when you do that, you go up and up and up on the side effects if you're using a drug like Dilaudid. Mm. So we get called to see somebody who's a little, every time you touch them anywhere, they're in pain. Mm. The nurses say we can't touch them anywhere. They might That's have some. That's the pain. allodynia. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. So they've had both so allodynia and hyperalgesia. They often do, exactly. Mm-hmm. And myoclonus potentially. But they'll have myoclonus unless they've been mm-hmm. on a benzo for their anxiety. Mm-hmm. Right. But don't. Don't rule it out just because they don't have myoclonus. I would say that hyperalgesia, myoclonus, hyperalgesia described also as wind-up. Is that right? Yes. Wind-up of the, the nervous uh, system. Yes, uh, that's what I meant about the spread, that, that mm-hmm. sensation spreads up and down the spinal column. Mm-hmm. So that one hurt one touch one place can hurt someplace completely different. Mm-hmm. I think that's prob- probably what uh, one of the symptoms that I miss most. You know, true confessions of a palliative yeah. practicing palliative care physician. Um, I worry that I miss that often, particularly patients in our hospice unit who are mm-hmm. often, you know, not on IV fluids, getting dehydrated, getting 
ever escalating doses of uh, mm-hmm. of IV Dilaudid. And then the pain just, I can't, I don't know what to do about this pain. I suspect that part of that's hyperalgesia. It is. And you may have missed the turnoff between delirium and, and pain, mm-hmm. or your nurses may have. Mm-hmm. So that when the patient is moaning, it's actually because they're delirious. Mm-hmm. And the opioid is making things worse. Right. So we started so off the, talking about ketamine. Yeah. Uh, should we get back to ketamine? Well, yeah, well, let's before ketamine. So our options for treatment for hyperalgesia, A, you can lower the dose of the opioid. Mm -hmm. You can do an opioid rotation Mm -hmm. or you can do ketamine. Are are those the three potential options? Um, I would say that to do the opioid rotation, you often need the ketamine. Yeah. So that the opioid rotation and ketamine go hand in hand. Our challenge okay. often to that, I've used ketamine a couple times in yeah. 15 years, over 15 years of doing this. And our challenge is the only place we can do ketamine is in our ICU. So now we have to transfer yeah. that patient. So we often do opioid rotations um, uh, without it. But honestly, right now, like in our hospice unit, I uh, once I start getting into higher and higher doses, I, I recognize earlier on that just pouring more of the same in mm-hmm. often is not the best approach. So I'm using adjuvants like methadone um, mm-hmm. or switching to other agents much sooner than I did 15 mm-hmm. years ago. I think that's such an important insight is that neuropathic pain does not respond to any opioid but methadone really. Mm. And so in your hospice unit, if the dilaudid isn't working, And again, you're not doing lots of CAT scans in your hospice unit and so Mm -hmm. forth. But if you can imagine, usually often that the retroperitoneum, for example, is involved, Mm -hmm. at least in a cancer patient, there's usually a cause, a neuropathic cause that's subtle, like retroperitoneal nodes or invasion of the plexus in the pelvis or the plexus in the lumbosacral area. Rectal cancer patients. Oh my uh, ovarian, gosh. Like mm-hmm. I, it, it is Let's so hard because of that plexus being. Mm-hmm. So what we've taught our fellows, actually what my fellows taught me is why are we making these people toxic? Why don't we just start on methadone? Yeah. And mm-hmm. I thought, duh, yes. Joel Carter taught that to me, Alex. Mm. So if I know a person has rectal cancer or ovarian cancer or uterine cancer or a colon cancer that's recurrent in the you know, in those nodes, I start with methadone. Mm-hmm. And in open no knee patients, you're doing like methadone to start off with 2.5 or 5? Yeah, BID. And usually these people will have been on something that I can transition. Right. Yeah. Because I get them referred to me. So they'll, mm-hmm. they'll have been on something mm-hmm. that I then immediately transition to methadone. And mm-hmm. I also loved people. your book because in the, sorry to trans. Uh, we will get to ketamine. I, I promise. That's no, okay. I, <laughs> <side can't laughs> I loved in your book because I think the number one thing is people don't re- realize methadone is both a short acting agent and a long acting agent. Right. And initially, it's just a short acting agent. Like it yes. takes a while to build up its long acting activity. Can you describe yeah. that for me? Sure. I just want to be clear that the person in the book isn't real. One of my fellows thought the person was real. <laughs> so I just <laughs> want to say that I made that person up. She said, but it's so real. So I wanted a disclaimer there. So yes, uh, methadone is short acting and long acting. And so that in somebody, especially who's been on something like Dilaudid, what I'll do when the Dilaudid pushes are not working, which they're usually not, I'll substitute methadone, uh, a methadone PRN. And I usually give it, uh, methadone three times a day because in case I, in case it's such a good reliever, it's so exquisitely sensitive neuropathic pain. If they feel great by day two, I know I've overdone the methadone. Mm-hmm. And I have methadone PRN. Yeah, in someone who, again, this is you have to be careful. We we mm-hmm. watch them carefully, but somebody who is not responding to the dilaudid PRNs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure you've seen those people, you're giving four or six of dilaudid PRN and nothing happens, IV. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That person's going to get myoclonic and neurotoxic weight because they're not responding. Mm-hmm. So in that person, I would give five of methadone because it would get them like, you can give it Q6. I usually tend to give it Q12 PRN. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I just started using methadone PRN. Somebody who's on around-the-clock methadone, and then also using methadone PRN with 
pretty good results. Uh, oh, never good. really done that because I've always worried about, you know, the half-life of methadone is heterogeneous and exceptionally long in some folks. So the idea of yeah. using that as a PRN scares the bejesus out of me. <laughs> well, are these people at home or in your unit? Both. <laughs> well, at home, I would I would really want a good observer yeah. in the home that was really reliable, who would tell me if the patient, not the first day, I mean, if they're in really bad pain and they go to sleep, they're supposed to go to sleep, right? Because mm -hmm. they finally have their pain relieved. Yeah. yeah. But if, if they're sedated the next day, then that might be a sign not to use the method on PRN anymore or to lower the standing dose. Mm -hmm. so, so getting back to ketamine, for those who have access, who are able to use ketamine in settings, you know, like the wards or in, the, in their hospice units or their mm -hmm. palliative care units, um, I wish it were so for us. <laughs> we didn't have to transfer patients to the ICU. Um, how, how would you use ketamine to treat hyperalgesia? So... What the ketamine really does is allow you to lower the opioid drastically because mm. that's what you want to do. You want to go mm -hmm. back to where they were before they got hyperalgesic, mm -hmm. like the patient we saw who's on for an hour of dilaudid, and then we come back in the next day and they're on 12 an hour of dilaudid mm -hmm. because the team missed the, you know, the, the turnoff. And so there we want to go back to for an hour. Mm -hmm. It's hard to explain that to the family. They're in terrible pain and we're going to lower. Yeah. <laughs> right. Dose. And I always thought with ketamine mm -hmm. too. So, at, you know, thinking about how to actually do this, I always thought yeah. um, you got to decrease the dose of the opioid when you start ketamine. Do you keep the opioid, let's say they're on a dilated infusion, do you keep that the same or do you do you no, it by half? That's what I'm saying is that I, I only use ketamine because it's, you know, people don't like being dissociated from themselves mostly. Yeah. Because that's a side effect. They don't kind of like saying, um, oh, who is that? So I use mm -hmm. it when they're toxic. And so I need to lower the dose of the opioid. And also remember, it's a pure NMDA agonist, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really going to be a good pain reliever in that patient because the problem here is too much um, that you need to block that NMDA activity so the opioid will work. The advantage mm -hmm. of methadone is it blocks the NMDA and it binds the opioid receptor. But in the three days it takes, or five days, it takes for the methadone levels to rise, you need to give them something that will deal with the pain and mm -hmm. that allows you to lower the, the dilaudid dose, if you will, while you're giving. I usually leave the dilaudid, I add the methadone, mm -hmm. and uh, but I lower the dilaudid back to where they weren't toxic. And I add the ketamine. Mm -hmm. so I do all all three things at once. And how much ketamine do you? This is IV ketamine. This is IV, and again, I I look it up every time. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, okay. I looked it up for this talk. I mean, and it's it's there's nothing magic about it. There's a recipe in the book. Mm -hmm. um, there is page three hundred eight. I'm looking at it right now. Practice <laughs> bunch of ketamine. You got a beautiful. Uh, little practice box. Because who remembers? Practice box tells you exactly what to do. And I think it would be dangerous to remember, to be honest. Yeah. This is one of the things you want to look up every yeah. time you use it. Better and you want to go up. over it, the DAG, with your colleagues, with the nurses, with mm -hmm. the nurse manager. You want everybody to feel comfortable and let them know what the side effects are. Mm -hmm. That and also disassociative feeling. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it sort it let them know what that that's how their patient's going to feel, let the family know. Mm -hmm. And also alert them that you, if they do get hallucinations, you want to use a benzo. Benzo. Not, why a not benzo, a, not an antipsychotic? I don't know why, but it that's what works. Mm -hmm. The antipsychotics okay. don't work in hallucinations induced by NMDA inhibitors. I'm I not think sure that was why. on my palliative care boards. Oh my gosh. Technically, you, Alex, I don't think you can yeah, say that. you've agreed to the boards. You're not going to say what you uh, were Oh, okay. About. Right. That that may have that not been on my minds. palliative care boards. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't be the right answer. Who knows? That's what he answered. <laughs> okay, I got a question for you. Yeah. Right. Any other practice pearls on ketamine? Those are the major ones. Is is uh, oh, carefully pick your patient. You know, you don't want people who would be totally freaked out by dissociation. Okay. Because that's not a good idea. Oh, okay, I got a question. I think it really works well, and I think that anybody. I think it's good to try to get that DAG. Get your pharmacy colleagues to get it through 
and talk to the nurses about it and tell them that it's it's really not dangerous and you should be able to give it in your hospice unit like we can in our intensive palliative care unit. Mm-hmm. I, I, feel like, I feel like every two to three years, our field falls in love with a new medicine. This oh. year, buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is so hot right now in palliative care. So hot. <laughs> So hot. Um, uh, ketamine was a hot topic for a couple of years at HPM meetings. Yeah. It has about, its uses. Yeah, about 10 years, maybe eight years ago, it was all lidocaine. Lidocaine, lidocaine, lidocaine. Um, is lidocaine helpful? <laughs> I can't say. In the patients I take care of, not really. Perhaps in chronic pain patients who don't have cancer, mm. they... I know that the anesthesia pain people give lidocaine infusions. Yeah. I have not found it to be helpful, but the literature suggests that it is helpful. So Mm. I would not spend a lot of time on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you you really don't use a lot of lidocaine anymore? No, I never did actually. I used other stuff, but. Mm -hmm. Uh Um, uh, Well, going back to buprenorphine, which is incredibly hot. um, Yeah. What is the role of buprenorphine for cancer pain? So it's what are tricky. Advantages because, and disadvantages. Yep. Yeah. Advantages are it's a patch, put it on for seven days. It doesn't induce as much respiratory depression. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's good for neuropathic pain. I mean, it has mm-hmm. a lot of good uses. Yeah. And I'm just going to throw it out. I want your opinion on this too, as we talk about pros and cons. Because mm-hmm. a lot more people are getting immunotherapy, right? And there's a concern for opioids with some immunosuppressant effect of morphine and other agents. And I've heard maybe buprenorphine may not have that same. And I think this is all kind of a little hand wavy, hand wavy. Is that how how do you feel about opioids, immunosuppression, and whether or not buprenorphine is a better drug? I don't really know the data on fentanyl, buprenorphine, or methadone. Okay. The, The morphine family, there's some pretty good data. But these are other families. Yeah, Miller Davis would know. He knows everything about this kind of thing. Yeah, I, yeah. I was. I was. I don't. If I, if I was wondering about, about it, this. I would call Mel and say, "Is it okay for me to use in, <laughs> in an immunotherapy patient?" But the the problem with buprenorphine in our patients is the limit on the size of the patch you can use in the U.S. because <laughs> of the QT prolongation. The biggest patch you can use is twenty. Twenty. And that's 80 of oral morphine equivalents. Mm, which and often isn't enough. For, way for not enough. Now, maybe in a regular patient. cancer patient population, not the palliative care population, hmm. it would be fine. Hmm. It they would be limit fine. It, mm-hmm, you were saying because of QTC issues? Yeah, that's why the FDA limited it. So huh. that's the problem. And then there's also the antagonist effect, you know. So if you're using, for example, if you're using... It with other opioids, if you need to use high doses of other opioids, I've I've seen in somebody who was on Suboxone, for example, but had more pain. She mm-hmm. was on 24 a day of the Suboxone, the buprenorphine equivalent. Mm-hmm. But as we started the methadone, she really got into a withdrawal situation. So we had mm-hmm. to stop the buprenorphine and just give methadone. And then we got her up to a the level she needed for pain and for suppression of craving. Yeah. But that can be very tricky. Mm-hmm. And it has the same problems of fentanyl with fevers. Oh, yes. Yeah. So let's talk is about that. Fentanyl? fentanyl, this is something that I, I there are those things that um, are probably not as well known as they should be. And that we oh. go around teaching, you know, house staff um, every year because it's something they haven't heard of. And I think one of the things that you taught me, there's so many things that you taught me that I find myself teaching. I'm like, oh, I'm channeling Janet again Mm -hmm. on the wards. Um, uh, One of them is that in patients who have cancer and who are on fentanyl patch, they often get febrile, right? They get uh, neutropenic fever, so common. And that there's issue with fentanyl, uh, transdermal fentanyl and, and febrile patients. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so the fentanyl patch is basically a delivery device to create a sub Q reservoir of fentanyl in the fat of a person. Mm -hmm. So a, you have to have fat and B you have to show the nurse where to put the patch Mm -hmm. because the underarm area 
is the best place. They end up putting it on the scapula. They, I've seen it on a, on a clavicle. Ah. I've seen it like anywhere that there isn't any fat. And guess what? Mm-hmm. It's not working because there's no sub-Q reservoir. Mm-hmm. So when you have a sub-Q reservoir of fentanyl, mm-hmm. if you get a fever, you get dilation of the arteries that go to that reservoir and you get more absorption. Mm-hmm. And because cancer patients tend to be malnourished in general, Mm -hmm. they also have less albumin. Mm -hmm. So the free fraction of the drug is going to increase if they Mm -hmm. get it all acidotic Mm -hmm. or septic. Mm -hmm. If the double whammy of increased absorption Mm -hmm. and increased free fraction, especially in in malnourished people, that can Mm -hmm. really tip you over into respiratory depression. Mm -hmm. So ways back, I did a a deep dive because sometimes I like to nerd out on this because um, mm-hmm. uh, I kept on hearing about the fat <laughs> thing. Yeah. As, as far as I can tell, while I agree, like fevers, clearly some studies looking at this increase absorption by 10 to 30 percent um, uh, and like heat packs, hot tubs, hot showers, fevers, all can do it. My understanding is the cutaneous depot of fentanyl is actually in the very high layers of the skin, the stratum corneum, which is not fatty. So you got this depot in the high layers. So so absorption is really governed by the microcirculation of to that stratum corneum and Mm. skin permeability. That's probably why we see like cactic patients. (laughs) That's why we see like in cactic patients, we see, you know, it's a very huge variable absorption. It usually doesn't work. They usually have what I call a fentanyl vest. Yeah. yeah. And they're not decreasing the, the amount of PRN dilaudid they use at all. Yeah, fentanyl vests are just covered in fentanyl patches. Yeah. I yeah. stop when I've it gets that. above like 400 or 500. Like, what? Yeah. It's not working anymore. <laughs> right. That's, yeah, that's right. And I think that there are a couple other caveats that, I mean, it does take 12 to 18 hours. So that to me, that's, and they did very good studies on that. It's a very acute rise. Mm-hmm. of the fentanyl levels. So it's going somewhere yeah. as a depot for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. Janet, I got a question for you. To not have the liver metabolize it immediately. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now remember also out these days, the biggest barrier is the tattoo sleeve because you can't put it over the tattoos, you know, and so many people nowadays, maybe it's an East coast thing, uh-huh. but have a whole arm full of tattoos, a sleeve. Does, so, does the tattoo go ink? through the ink? And there's scar tissue there. Oh. Huh. And it also won't go through lymphedema because there's water there. I saw somebody withdraw one time. Oh, wow. Because it won't go through water. Hmm. To, so it's, an, it's, it's tricky to use, but mm-hmm. in the right patient, I think it could be make all the difference. Mm-hmm. All right, Janet, I never pull up a fentanyl table. I just use the two to one rule, which is every Me two. Yeah. Do you, yep. you use two to one? Mm-hmm. I you want to describe do what the two to one rule is? The oral morphine equivalent is twice as much as what the fentanyl patch is. So if you have mm-hmm. 100 OMEs, the fentanyl patch is 50. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you do a little dose reduction. And when you do that dose reduction, you come up the same thing as the patch. Um, well, I don't do a dose reduction for, for fentanyl. I oh, just you don't? Do. No. Why because not? of the way that numbers were derived. And I'm I'm listening to my pharmacist who was trained by Mary McPherson, so I know she's right. <laughs> Anything Mary McPherson says. <laughs> she says it. Bridget Scullion, who's our head of our pharmacy program, says it. Uh-huh. I do whatever they tell me. All right. Bridget's I got terrific. a question. Can I can I Alex, is it okay if I switch back to switch. methadone for a second? Yeah, yeah, go. Okay, I gotta ask, because I've been talking with my fellows about this. What do you use for methadone conversion? Or do you use anything at all? Because you always come up with either five TID or you know, 10 TID as your final That's outcome. You when, and you ever do anything <laughs> other than 10 TID, you've probably done your math wrong. Do you use <laughs> methadone conversion? I use the new one that everybody agreed on, which is also in the book. Just to mm-hmm. mention that the proceeds of the book all go to my department. They do yes. not go to me. Just mm-hmm. want to make it clear. So um, under a hundred, you start with a certain amount, and then there's no ratio. Then from a hundred to two hundred, you divide by ten OMEs. Hundred to two hundred OMEs, you divide by ten, and over two hundred, you divide by twenty, which is why it is an asymptotic curve, and it mm-hmm. it always does come out to. Sometimes it comes out to five BID though. Sometimes it comes out to 5 BID. You're, you're but, never getting um, above 10 TID. 
I tend to actually I, you I can mean. if it's one of these patients. The question is, and I asked yeah. Russ Portner this ages ago, do you ever start at more than 10 TID? Because I've had patients on 10 an hour of dilaudid, right? Mm-hmm. So that's 240 of dilaudid a day. So that's 240 of methadone a day, yeah. IV dilaudid. Mm-hmm. So I've had a patient on 10 an hour of IV dilaudid getting a little myoclonic. That's 240 of IV dilaudid multiplied by 20 for the OMEs, divide by 20 for the ratio. Mm-hmm. And you're at 240. So what do you do with that? I don't know. What right. I do with that is 10 TID, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. to be, and that, But that's the kind of patient I would use methadone as the PRN. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. That's the kind of patient I would use that. Um, and what would you use your PRN dose? Would, Five, 10? I would start with five. Five. There's no data on this. I've just yeah. noticed that it's safe. Remember, I only do inpatient care. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I can watch these people really carefully. Right. I haven't gotten into trouble with it, to be honest. Right, yeah. right, right. I've gotten more trouble with the people getting myoclonic and hyperalgesic from the dilaudid. Mm-hmm. And that's with all the adjuvants. Of course, we use adjuvants. Right, right. Oh, okay, yeah. I got another. Yeah. Alex, can I switch yeah, subjects? Go, please. <laughs> all right. Somebody you got so much you can with, talk about here. Uh, uh, Cancer, neuropathic pain um, uh-huh. from from their chemotherapy that they had. Uh, not on any opioid yet. Not on any treatment. What's your go to first line? So you're talking about the neuropathy, the peripheral neuropathy. Peripheral neuropathy. You're not talking about neuropathic pain, like yeah. No peripheral neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy. Hands, hands, and, from hands and feet. Or right. So the data is really awful on this. Um, the data does show that. The pet, gabapentinoids don't work for this. Hmm. And the only but everybody's drug, on a gabapentin drug. Yeah, but they shouldn't be. It's just toxicity. It really doesn't work for that. I mean, well, I think it's the sedation that probably reason, helps, right? Pardon? <laughs> it's probably so like sedated, baclofen, where it's the care. sedation. Right. I mean, if the patient has another reason to have neuropathic pain, like shingles, like yeah. um, mm-hmm. cancer invading their nerves, mm-hmm. right, go for the pregabalin. No question. But um, duloxetine is the only drug that has been shown to be helpful in uh, platinum-induced and taxane-induced peripheral neuropathy. The Uh most important thing on on that is prevention these days, guys. So if you're asked cold, hands and feet, Mm -hmm. big difference to prevent peripheral neuropathy is using cold packs on the hands and feet. Very good studies showing that that makes a huge difference in preventing peripheral neuropathy. Hmm. Once it's there, it's really a problem to treat. So drugs that you think may cause peripheral neuropathy, cold packs. Well, while they're getting it, there's a while special getting the drug. Put. Oh, so keep yeah. it away from those nerves. Decrease yes. the circulation to your yes. hands and your foot. Yes, and there's no data that that increases relapse or anything like that. Just like the thing on the head where they have a it Ice decreases crown hair mm-hmm. loss. Mm-hmm. But it's really powerful. And people who are getting these repeat, repeat, repeat doses of full, full Fox and things like that, that get it so often having cold in the hands and feet has made all the difference. Mm. From tax law. The other drugs have not shown to be helpful in chemo induced peripheral neuropathy because mm-hmm. you've killed those nerves. Basically don't people tell you they feel like they're walking around in pizza boxes. I mean, the nerves are dead. Mm-hmm. Um, if they're burning. Yeah. And it, you might as well try the pregabalin if they're burning. Yeah. And yeah. why pregabalin over gabapentin? Because it's linearly absorbed. So better bioavailability. Much, much better bioavailability. Gabapentin, after about 600 a day or in a dose, after mm. more than 400 in a dose, remember there's an active transport metabolism for gabapentin if we're nerding out here. Mm-hmm. So when you get higher doses, it's just not transported across the gut, period. You're, you're getting 25% of what you're giving this patient at enormous cost. So usually if the patient doesn't respond to 300 three times a day, insurance will let you give the uh, pregabalin because they're generics now. And can mm-hmm. I ask, uh, when you do that, let's say somebody is on 900 milligrams gabapentin mm-hmm. a day, you're all, this ain't working, I want to try pregabalin. Do you just stop the gabapentin and start yeah, the pregabalin switch. or do you titrate the gabapentin down? No, and- you can just switch. You can just because it's the same therefore, mechanism of action, right? There's yeah, it's it's the pre-drug, really. You know, GABA is the pre-drug of GABA. So it's the same mechanism of action. You just substitute kind of depending on what their dose is. So if 300, you could start anywhere from 50 to 
a hundred. I mean, it depends on what the side effects are that you're worried about sedation and so forth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Somebody's on 900, three times a day. I give them a hundred, 150, three times a day. Mm-hmm. Of the pregabalin, hundred, yeah. 150. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's really My- a cleaner drug. If we could get um, insurance approval all the time, I would only use pregabalin because mm-hmm. you know, it's being linearly absorbed. Mm-hmm. It should become generic soon. Shouldn't it? I think so. So we can look for that. Yeah. So the most difficult cancer-related pain, I mean, there are a lot. There's a lot that are challenging to treat. But the one that's most common that I find very difficult to treat is like radiation-induced mucositis in, Hmm. you know, the mouth and the throat and the esophagus. Any thoughts about treatment for radiation-induced mucositis? So, again, we're treating patients with, I just need to be a little... Patients with radiation-induced mucositis. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually find that somewhat hopeful Mm. because it's going to go away. Yeah, right, right. It's self-limited. I have a couple of strategies. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, a PCA, that's well Mm -hmm. known to be the right treatment because you push the button when you're swallowing, besides all the topical treatments. But because it's a neuropathic pain, Mm -hmm. methadone is good for that too. Ah, I have and not you can tried put the met- liquid methadone in the feeding tube, can't you? Ah. Also, the pills dissolve completely. If you can't get the liquid for some reason, uh-huh. methadone tablets dissolve completely in water. Huh. So you-, so you can use the tablets in the feeding tube too for somebody with head and neck. Well, cancer. you wouldn't use the tablets. No, you you would dissolve the tablet in water mm-hmm. first. And then and then yeah. put it in the feeding tube if you can't get the liquid. Yeah. But to have a low level of that, especially in somebody who's at week three of head and neck mm-hmm. radiation, and you know mm-hmm. things are only going to get worse for yeah. the next five weeks. Yeah. Um, and they have a low threshold and are just like out of their minds. Because mm-hmm. um, there's always some chronic pain. It isn't mm-hmm. always when they swallow. Mm-hmm. So methadone is my secret go-to, and it works really well. That's great. We have to get to hypnosis. What is the role of hypnosis and how did you become interested in hypnosis as a treatment for um, for symptoms in cancer? So remember, I started back with the Grateful Dead, right? So I started caring for cancer patients a long time before we had good agents that were long acting. And also I kind of believe in the power of the mind to concentrate and affect sensation very much. So Mm -hmm. Uh, I had a fam. my my grandmother had a family physician who used hypnosis with her. Mm. So when I started doing oncology and all I had was morphine and Percodan and Compazine, right. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is before Zofran. This is before MS cotton. I had methadone also. That's why I'm so comfortable with methadone. That was my Mm -hmm. long neck. I thought there must be something else I can do. So there's a wonderful organization called the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis that gives trainings from Thursday afternoons to Sunday afternoon, Sunday mornings, different places every month in the country. I thought, I bet I could do this. I could use imagery and I could help people be someplace they'd really rather be, which mm-hmm. is good. Or I can help them connect to their bodies in spooky ways. Mm-hmm. And so I got trained and then when I worked with my sickle cell patients, they're like, yeah, we do that all the time. How do you think we st- how we deal with the crisis pain? Because nobody's giving us pain medicine. Remember the mm-hmm. day when nobody would give a sickle cell patient pain medicine. Yeah. Um, oh. Or I would work with a patient with nausea and vomiting to help her be somewhere she'd really rather be so that she vomited, but it wasn't, there was no um, affect associated with the vomiting. She would just mm-hmm. vomit and then she could get through her treatment. Mm -hmm. Um, also you could just change things with kids. You can do eye surgery because they can be looking at a TV and you don't have to anesthetize them and you can do strabismus surgery. Wow. It's a very powerful technique. And for people who have stopped being able to swallow because of their mucositis, you know, Mm -hmm. they're getting better. I talk about a river and the water running through and you bring in all the senses. I used to do it for bone marrows all the time. I would take them out to wherever they wanted the, the woods or the ocean and bring in all the senses and the sounds. One guy said, I know what you're doing. I want to go to the mountains, not the ocean. Okay. We'll go to the mountains. (laughs) And, and my fellow was so funny. She said, I, for the next three months, I smelled cider donuts every time I did (laughs) because we did cider donuts. It's, it's very 
connect and it connects you so beautifully to your patients. Mm-hmm. You can make tapes, you know, it used to be tapes, but you can do a phone recording for them. Mm-hmm. Um, you can really so, help them, as I said, so be somewhere they'd really rather be in and decrease the anxiety component. And you can change pain colors. So, Jan, can I ask, um, like that. a lot of what I'm hearing is, it sounds like there's some relaxation techniques, yes. potentially breathing. We know distraction is incredibly important when it comes yes. to pain. Yes. But when I think about, and I think probably a lot of people, they have their own stereotypes of what hypnosis is. Like you have, yes. you know, that person with the watch, he, you know, Never use a watch. hypnotizes you and you start you know, acting, like, acting a like a chicken. Right. Um, yeah, no, what you is have to do an education beforehand. You have to say, I'm not going to, you're not going to do anything that you wouldn't otherwise do. And I'm convinced of that because I've done a lot of training in hypnosis. Yeah. You're not going to do anything you wouldn't otherwise do. What we're going to do is just enhance your ability. I'll say like when you're at a really good movie, you don't notice that four people have moved in next to you and are crunching on their popcorn, right? You don't hear that. Yeah, mm. you're watching the movie, and when you wake up, it's like, wait a minute, this theater was empty when I came here. Mm. It's the same. You give them an introduction that it's the same focus. We're just going to help you not hear things you don't need to hear, and focus your imagery on. It's different than just distraction because I don't. And how is it different than guided that are activated that are incredibly powerful in being able to, like I would burn my hand on a frying pan. And then I kind of put it over here because I could get the image of cold there. And my husband would say, oh, you burned your hand again, you know, and I, would, I wouldn't I would blister. Or I had somebody in the lab who cut his, his hand on some glass, went to the ED and he was a Russian. I said, remember what the feeling is of cool snow, fresh snow in your hand. Let's get that feeling of that cool, fresh snow. I used an alcohol swab to induce it. He stopped bleeding. Your yeah. autonomic nervous system responds really well. So there's lots of wonderful things that you can do and it can feel so powerful. It Mm. certainly doesn't take the place of things, but for many of my patients, it's a wonderful adjunct waiting for the pain medicine to kick in or just Mm -hmm. getting more power back, you know? Yeah, I like, I I also, uh, one of the things that really appeals to me about this is that connection that you form with your patient. Yeah, uh, doing this uh, hypnosis guided with imagery, you. and you're going, you're on the journey together. Yes, and then you bring mm-hmm. them back with as much as they want to bring back, as much as they're comfortable bringing back. Mm-hmm. That's what you say it when you're trained. Mm-hmm. You'll bring, and people do therapy with this. I don't. I don't do dentistry with it. I don't mm-hmm. do OB with it. Mm-hmm. I don't do psychotherapy with it. I just do medicine with it, um, mm-hmm. or palliative medicine with it. Mm-hmm. And I do it without induction because patients are already induced. You know that look when they're not swallowing, they're listening to every word you're saying? Mm -hmm. That's a patient already induced. All you have to do is give, be really careful with your words. Don't say this is going to hurt a lot. Say you may feel something. I don't know what you're going to feel. I wonder what you're going to feel. That's why I'm so intent about words. That's the other thing it's taught me is I cannot bear to hear somebody say, you failed the chemotherapy, you failed the treatment, because that patient hears fail. Mm. You know, the treatment isn't working anymore. Mm -hmm. But that's why they ask you, what should you eat differently? Or what should I do? Mm -hmm. I can't bear to hear the ICU team say, we're going to withdraw care. Mm -hmm. Because that's what, that literally is what that family hears next door. Oh, gee, I wonder when they're going to stop caring for my loved one. Mm -hmm. So hypnosis has taught me the power of words for Mm -hmm. good and for harm. Mm -hmm. And there will be uh, coming an enhancement with me doing a hypnotic induction online later in this year. Um, There are a lot of enhancements connected to the book where we'll show you the things we talk about, like uh, communication topics and hypnosis and what to say at the end of life to families. So -hmm. the book is just one aspect. And then we're hoping to um, improve your skill set by showing you how to do these things. I promise to do it when my voice is better, though. <laughs> do you think more palliative care teams should have somebody trained in hypnosis? I think that would be really helpful. Yes, I think that it's an underused, really powerful specialty, and it's easy to get trained. Yeah. Well, Janet, um, I really want to thank you. There is so much more in your book. Really want to encourage <laughs> all of our listeners to check it out. 
Thank uh, you. We'll have links uh, to where to buy it on our Great. show notes. But before we end, I think Alex is is gearing up for a little more Grateful Dead. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Most of the cats that you meet on the street speak of true love Most of the time they're sitting and crying at home One of these days they know they gotta get going Out of the door and down to the street all alone Chucking like the doodop man Who once told me you got to play your hand Sometimes your cards ain't worth a dime If you don't lay them down Well, Janet, very big thank you for joining us and for You're writing welcome. this book. Really loved reading it. So glad. Thanks for everything. And as always, thank you, Archstone Foundation, and to all of our listeners. Thank you very much for supporting the Jerry Powell Podcast. We'd also like to thank the generous support from our listeners who've donated $250 or more to the Jerry Powell Podcast, including Meg Walhagen, Thomas Quinn, Rochelle Bernacki, Louise Aronson, James Tulski. Arden O'Donnell, Mike Steinman, Marianne Forcia, Ashok Krishnaswamy, Nancy Lunderberg, Gail Cooney, David Schiffling, Cheryl Phillips, Jessica Ng, Harry Hahn, Elizabeth Chung, Kathy Foley, Rochelle Bernacki, Christine Ritchie, and Lloyd Wolstadt. Thank you very much. <laughs>